So we are going to start and we are going to discuss socio-ecological system modelings. So the first question would be, everybody is ready? Are you waiting for Franklin? <laughs> Franklin, this is the most important thing you need to do, so I'll start. Eh? <laughs> anyway, we start. So the first question would be, why do we need to model things? So I want you to reflect that, in fact, everybody does modeling. We imagine what can happen in the future, you know, when we get home, what do we need to do, or with the little money we are saving, what are we going to invest on, then in fact, everybody thinks. The difference is that when we think ourselves, and we don't write down the things, we don't know what are the assumptions, that if I continue saving at this rate, I'm going to have this amount of money to buy this plot of land. But you know, we don't write it down. So for others, it's hard for them to know what, what are you thinking really? What are the steps in the process? And also it's hard to compare with data because if you don't, if you don't put it on paper, you know, you cannot compare with anything. So in fact, the difference with people that do modeling is that they just write down this logic, what they think this process, and they write the assumptions in the steps that they're doing. So it's like we all do, but modelers put it in paper or in this case, in computers, okay? So the goal of modeling, there are many goals to modeling. Most people think is that we just use modeling to predict the future, which is not really the case. We mostly use modeling to understand a process that is happening or to guide future data collection, maybe to see what are the trade-offs in a land uh, use change. What are going to invest, what would be the benefits if we do this, what would be the benefits if we do that. Also, it's helpful in the policy dialogue. Instead of just coming there as a scientist and oh, you know, if you continue deforesting at this rate, there'll be no forest left. Okay, yeah, but put numbers. When? Which is the rate? What can be done? Maybe not to stop it, but to reduce it. So we can use modeling for all these 16 goals that are in the table, sorry, in the in the board and I'm just going to go through the maybe five that I think are maybe more useful to you. So the first one it's the difference between explanation of a process and prediction and I really like this sentence that says plate tectonics explains earthquakes and vol volcanic eruptions. You know most of them happen at the edges of the tectonic plates but they cannot really predict when the next will happen. It just helps explain where they happen and why but not you know, it's different understanding a process from predicting what may happen in the future. And um, for example, one of the patterns that I will uh, show you later is about flocking. So you know that sometimes, especially ducks, if you see a duck alone, it's going on its own. But when there's a few of them, they always go in this funny B shape. So actually we can use a model about um, why birds choose to do I guess you all know that behind, this is a kind of shape of the least resistance to the air. So this guy goes behind this one, so it's a little bit less resistant to the air, it's a little bit easier for him to fly, and so on and so forth in these two directions. So there's a reason for it. So we can actually code it. It's a bit like writing a script in R. So bird, if I have a bird in front of me, I will go behind him to the left. But I don't want to get too close, otherwise we might hit the other one. So you can write these little logic steps of what this bird is thinking at any time when he does this and then we can show the pattern. I'll show you in a second in, in the computer. I think modeling, a very important aspect of modeling is to help guide future data collection. So for example, this is a study done in, uh, in Eastern Africa. So these guys plot the pink dots, I don't know if you see very well, is where they had collections of acacia, certain acacia species. And they compare, you know, they had the collection, presence, absence, where these things are. I mean, this is town knows very well. Eh? So we compare with the climate information. Okay, how much is rainfall is in these areas? What is the topography? And then we build the relationship. So these trees like to live in these certain conditions. And then we look for similar conditions elsewhere in the region. So for example, this species is mostly found here. But we see that the environment is pretty similar in these other areas. Maybe nobody went to collect it there before. There's no roads. That might be one of the explanation, but it could be found there. So if we have a project and we are interested in finding these species, we could go to these new, I mean, to these areas that seem to 
be suitable for the species but it hasn't been collected and this is another example of this mostly collected from here and in southern Uganda but possibly also found in southern Tanzania and in Rwanda and Burundi as well maybe there's just no collections of this so this is one example another example of what we can do with modeling is to see the trade-offs so for example we have an area uh, where there's um, droughts and when there are droughts these animals let's say is a, I don't know a zebra goes around and find grass in these other areas but they like to live here because it's near the water so nobody would bother going far if there's enough grass here so the question you can investigate for example is what would happen if we put if we start selling the land around here and their fences how are they going to move these animals so in this case these guys looked at drought so when there are droughts where animals go you can see here that they would go to these other areas of grass but what would happen if there was not just droughts but also more fencing so we can instead of doing the experiment sometimes it's expensive to set up these experiments eh? to just put fences and see where the zebra goes okay it costs a lot of money and you know you need to have a few zebras experimenting with a color to know but we can do maybe just put a color and a couple of zebras and they do some modeling to see where are the others likely to go another goal is to help the policy dialogue so for example in this study that's one of the papers I gave you for reading Kariuki et al 2018 they studied how much we pay the poor pastoralists living around Amboseli and Masai Mara for them to be keen to keep the area in ranching and not turn it into agriculture so you know it's hard to go and do okay I pay you ten dollars let's see how much I cultivate I'll pay you 20 let's see how much you cultivate so we can do some modeling to inform what could be the potential solution some things are hard to experiment in real life so we can do modeling to help discuss what are the options another one is to educate the general public or maybe your students about the process and this one I want to show it to you so it's actually found in, in NetLogo so we can open NetLogo and NetLogo always have a button that it's called setup I mean you can try later on eh? I'm just going to go quickly here and then you call the setup I'll add some clouds in my model and I'll add some CO2 I'll put a lot imagine we are a lot of CO2 out there and then I click the button go and we can see how the I think it's really cool this one how the energy from the sun arrives some gets reflected by the earth some gets reflected by the clouds and some gets absorbed by the soil and you see the more CO2 that is out there the less that it's going out so the warmer that it's becoming our planet so this is a really easy tool for communication as you can see so that's also one of the objectives of modeling let me just stop it so we'll close this one so another objective of the of the modeling oh sorry so this is the last one I was showing you as an example eh? so I want to discuss today Asian based models so because there's many types of modeling out there eh? and I think the Asian based one it's very useful because humans think they're easy to think as agents so Asian based modeling is also called individual so it's like they're individuals but you know because when we use the word individuals a bit more like to people they rather think about Asian because agents could also be animals and moving around or things like that eh? so the idea is that we can set a few rules to determine how these agents are going to behave so if I'm a zebra my priority is to drink and to eat is it so how many times a day do I need to go to the waterfall the water hole how much grass do I need every day it's quite a straightforward eh? it's a bit like writing a very logical thing now we this is the simple this is a zebra roaming around now we put a fence okay when I hit the fence I walk to the left I cannot cross it I don't like jumping so we start building the model about what things happens and of those of you that already um, tried the um, the tutorials of NetLogo I think it's very easy in this example of a car there's a car driving if the car in front of him goes too slower it will reduce the speed if the car in front of him goes faster and there's a space and there's no police they'll just go faster is it 
So you adapt your behavior depending on the, what the others around you are doing. And that's something that is very interesting that Asian-based models let us do. So not only you, you choose your own behavior, but you can adapt by what is the surroundings. You can kind of perceive the environment. So this is the idea of the... And did you see that actually there was nothing happening and there was traffic jam? Just because people start to reduce the speed and the other ones behind too and they start blocking. So one of the particular interesting points of Asian Bain modeling models is that it helps us uh, discover emergent patterns, which is what I said. So it's a property that it's observed that were not, was not obvious from the beginning. So if we think about the birds that I showed you before, if a bird is flying on its own, going around, it could go in any direction. But if it's a group of birds, then they start to form this pattern. So when I think about emergence, I always think like that. It's something that if we had the individual separated, we would not see. But when you put them together, it starts happening. It's a bit like church, eh? you go to church, I mean, you are in your house, you can pray, but most likely you will not sing. But if you go to church and your neighbor is singing and dancing, yourself, you get motivated to do the same. So it's a bit of the same thing. So people perceive the environment and they might change their behavior. So let me show you the flocking model. So it's also found in NetLogo. So we set up, so we, something appears in our screen and then we click the go button. So this is many, many birds flying around. And you will see, the logic of this is pretty easy. Eh? If I'm a bird, look at this one. I follow the one in front of me and it appears here. Eh? And the others, if they see a bird, they might turn. You see this one attached and follow the others. And if you wait long enough, you could start to see these pointy patterns, eh? You see? <laughs> you see, they all follow each other. Funny, eh, the birds? <laughs> mm? So this is something very easy that we can see happening. You can play with the model in that logo as well, eh? So I'll stop this one. Hi, what about plants? They don't fly, so how do you... <laughs> Wait, it will come, it will come. So, so this is one of the advantages that we can discover with our models. Eh? We can see emerging patterns, but maybe that is not the objective of our model, eh? so it doesn't come to us, but I, I think it's good to think because if we code our individuals and we understand the system and they perceive changes around them, they can change their behavior. So it helps us understand complex systems. And that's where I'm going to go in a second. So the different types of models, the ones that are a like a simplified reality, this would be a little bit like the one I cho show you about climate change. Yeah? We have the clouds, we have the CO2, and we have the energy coming. We it, helps, it helps us understand the process but maybe we cannot use it for a publication, eh? it's not that precise. But it still has a very good value. There's level one, where is qualitative agreement. So it would be maybe like the flocking. It's true, eh? Birds, as they ma meet each other, they start following each other and they create this pattern. But maybe in the model I show you the, the speed that the birds fly, the size of the birds and how long they take to adapt is not really um, a replicate of the reality. It's just a little bit of the qualitative way. Eh? It's kind of in the same direction, but it's not detailed to really tell us at what speed this species of bird starts creating the flocking pattern. Then there's the level two, which is quantitative agreement. Maybe we do have the information for these birds to really recreate at which speed, at which height, depending on which number of birds they really recreate this flocking pattern. So if we have the information, our model can be more accurate and it would be like level two. <coughs> then there's a level three, which is that we can see the patterns happening that we expected using quantitative information and they actually match what we know in space and time. And this is really cool, but obviously this is the one that is hardest to create these models because we need a lot of data to inform these level three models. But it doesn't mean that you cannot try to build a model in level zero, one, or maybe even two, depending on the data that is out there and what is your interest. So there also when we think about types of models, there's three things or three categories that we could group them to. 
So they're the models of ecological interactions. So maybe just a species and the environment or maybe the grass growing depending on the rainfall. Then there's the models of social interaction. Could be within animals, it could also be within humans. I'm going to show you an example about viruses spread. And then there's the one that I really think is the most interesting for us, is when we try to combine both of these. When we try to see what happens at the more environmental level, but also how people are reacting to these changes in the environment, and then we can really see what is going to happen or we can uh, try to understand why people are making this decision and why the land use is changing at more of a landscape level. And I'm going to show you three examples about this. So let's start with the birth rates because I think it's very good for you guys. I mean, I'm sure you cannot go out after this class and build your own model in two minutes. You will not have it tomorrow. But I want you to go home knowing about this software that is for free, NetLogo, there's also other softwares, but I've been using a couple and I really like this one because there's tutorials out there and there's a lot of models in a database. I just want you to know that this is possible and it's not that difficult. So maybe you're not going to learn it tomorrow, but you know when you think in the long term, when you write your next project proposal, when you have a small consultancy, maybe this is something you can think about using. So the first one is about the birth rates. I just chose some examples randomly. Yeah? So this one, let me try to put it bigger for you. So we have in NetLogo, we always have the blank empty screen and then we have the buttons. So when we click the setup, two types of, uh, let's call it birds, are going to happen in our screen. And these birds have a different carrying, there's a different carrying capacity in the environment. There's not enough food for everybody. And some produce babies four times, I mean, twice as fast as the other ones. So the question would be, may one outcompete the other, for example? 